Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's episode is sponsored by Arc Silver Gold Osmium. They offer personal service and often the lowest price, period, with no minimum purchase for silver, gold, platinum, or osmium. ARC SGO is available to discuss precious metals by email, phone, or in person at their retail location in Jackson, Wyoming, and they are committed to providing the best prices out there and making sure you get the best value and lowest premiums on their wide selection of products. Go to ARCSGO.com and contact the owner, Ian Everard, at 307-264-9441. Or Ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell him that Commodity Culture sent you. And today's guest is the author of the Endgame Investor newsletter, where he talks about money to help people understand the nature of the endgame of the monetary system and how to survive it. We're going to be talking about gold, silver, how he sees the endgame unfolding, and more. It's Rafi Farber. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jesse. Good to be back. Well, let's start with. Getting your thoughts on gold's performance here, obviously hitting and sustaining all-time highs, at least in nominal U.S. dollar terms, is this a sign that things are starting to crack in the global monetary system? Um, the sign? I mean, there's signs everywhere. I'd say the most salient sign is how insane people are, uh, that there are no more borders in the United States and that uh, there's no more sexes. I mean, we're all just one fluidic sex. Um, I guess there's no more reproduction. Uh, basic logic is out the window pretty much everywhere. So yeah, things are cracking and it doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to see that. Uh, in terms of the price of gold, um, you know, it goes, it goes up and goes down. I can't say if this rally is uh, what is uh, going to precipitate the end of the banking system as we know it in terms of the proximate cause. Um, but uh, in my, uh, in a previous interview, I don't know who was maybe Liberty and finance. Um, yeah, it was Liberty and finance. And they asked me, you know, what do I think about the latest gold rally? I think it was in March 4th or 5th when it really started. And I was like, frankly, I'm surprised, um, because the monetary supply, the money supply isn't moving up. So what is causing, what is causing this? It's actually, it's still moving down. It's, it's been moving slightly up, but nowhere near the, um, Nowhere, nowhere near the top it was in April 2022. So it's still moving down. So then why are gold prices moving that? And there's no excitement among the stackers. All the excitement is in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and all this other magic. Uh, and the the even even those who chase ETFs aren't chasing them. GLD has been shedding uh, has been shedding ounces, shedding tons, and so have all the other ETFs. So uh, there's the, where's the excitement? What's going on? And it seems to be in the banks versus the high net wealth individuals are the ones who are having a war here because nobody else is involved. Uh, and usually when when the, the gold price moves like this, there's something going on in the banking system, but nobody can really identify exactly what it is until it happens. And we know something is going to happen because something always happens. Just by the sheer force of the logic of it, the more debt you issue, the more dollars are needed to pay it back. Uh, if you're shrinking the money supply at the same time, you're going to require more and more dollars on a smaller and smaller monetary base, and then something's going to explode. So nobody knows exactly where the fault line is, but it's going to happen. So it could be that the, the gold price is saying that that is near. Um, but when, when it does happen, it's going to bring gold prices down just a lot less than everything else. So uh, that's one of the confusing things in 2020 when gold went down from uh, whatever it was, it was uh, 1700, 1800, I don't remember exactly. Uh, and then it went down to a low of 1450. And everyone was like, oh, why is gold going down? But if you, if you measured uh, the gold to commodities ratio, it went to an all time high. I remember like oil was at negative 35 and gold went down from 1800 to 1450. Oh my gosh, it's so scary. Um, silver went down more. Uh, but that was the all-time high of, for gold prices r against pretty much everything uh, ever in economic history. So I'd say it was doing pretty well. Uh, but still, even, even so, we're going to have a final financial crisis. It's going to be the last one. Um, I'm willing to hang my hat on that. And gold prices are going to go down temporarily. And then 
the the, the Fed's going to provide all the dollars that everybody needs for the next I don't know year, which is probably going to be about seven, eight, nine trillion dollars, and then. It's just going to – gold is just going to go vertical, which means that the dollar is just going to go down, and uh, then you're going to see a real panic. So I think we're months away from that. It could be any time now. So the sentiment gets thrown around a lot where people say if gold goes to a certain price, 5000 10000 that's not a world I want to live in because we'll be in absolute chaos as if like a correlation with very high gold prices – kind of equates to geopolitical chaos, greater global conflict, things like that, greater societal collapse. Um, does a higher gold price correlate with those things or is it more subtle than that? Um, well, it, it does, but it's, it, it's, it kind of correlates with it. I mean, it really depends. The, the gold price moving is really the, how much money uh, how much money a dollar is worth, right? Gold is the money. The dollar is just the derivative. So it, if prices are heading down, you don't need as much money to sustain your life, right? You can, if, if production is heading up, uh, this is one of the, this is one of the confusing uh, paradoxical things about inflation. Like the more money you put into the system, the less the dollar is worth. But at the same time, for example, let's say with oil, the more the more dollars you have before they're spent on other things, they can be used as a um, they can be used to invest more in oil infrastructure and finding more oil. So then inflation will lead to a higher supply of oil, which will lead to lower oil prices for in some periods. Like the trend obviously is up, but for some periods, uh, more commodities can be taken out of the ground if you inflate. So that so people don't know does inflation cause lower prices? Does it cause higher prices? I mean, it depends. It, it, there's nothing is uh, is a one to one here. But the the trend is obviously yes, it causes higher prices. So if gold prices uh, head higher, meaning if if the the amount of money in a dollar plummets faster than the prices of other things fall, then you're going to really have uh, disruption in your standard of living because the prices of everything are going to go up. So that happened in the late 1970s to early 1980, and even in the mid 1970s, from like say 1972 to 1980, with about three years of uh, of calming in the mid 70s, the the there was a lot of panic about the global economy, not just the United States. So I think we're at the 1970s point where things start to spiral out of control, and they did spiral out of control in the 1970s, and Standard of standards of living really went down the tubes, um, and there was serious dollar panic among the central banks. If you look into the the transcripts of the Federal Reserve in the late 1970s, they're really panicking. It's really they're like we don't know what to do, Paul. What do we do? I'm talking, I'm talking about Paul Volcker, and and then it, the the tone there is just like despair. The only thing different between now and the 1970s is that in the 1970s the debt was in principle payable, right? Um, not, not the principal debt. I'm saying in in principle, it was payable. You could pay 20% interest rates on the debt because it was only like 35, 36% of GDP. And even that's a fake measure, but you could sustain this for a while. Um, but you can't now. So uh, this is it. Um, we're going to see interest rates head higher and higher. And the interest rates heading higher and higher means that the Fed has to pay more and more money to sterilize the, the, the money from uh, circulating into the economy, the, the way that it prevents money from circulating to the economy, prevents dollars from circulating is by paying interest on it. And that translates to Federal Reserve losses. So the higher interest rates go, the higher Federal Reserve losses. Um, and uh, that means the more unbacked dollars enter the system and you, end a, you enter a positive feedback loop, which we were on in 1979. Um, but, uh, eventually interest rates got control of the situation because the debt was still payable, but now it's not. So when we head there, it's just going to keep heading higher and higher and we will spiral out of control very quickly. Is there any sort of final desperate act that the government could take to somehow remove their own debt obligations, grant austerity to themselves, whether that be through issuing a central bank digital currency and saying, well, the old monetary system is no longer valid, so we don't owe money anymore. Um, you know, the, there's been some ideas floated around out there. Is there any like final desperate act that they could take to try to stop this whole thing from collapsing? There's nothing they can do to stop it from collapsing. Um, there, there might be something they can do to uh, prolong it 
from collapsing. I don't know what that would be. In 2020, the the idea was, well, let's lock everybody in their houses and put everybody in prison in the entire world. And then uh, we'll figure out, you know, we'll figure out what to do next. That was, that was how they did it back then. So I don't think that's going to fly this time. Um, can they use a central bank digital currency? We already have central bank digital currencies. It's called the dollar, right? It's a central bank currency and it's digital, right? Who cares if it's on a blockchain or not? What's the difference? Like if they, if they enter, if they start a central bank digital currency that's on a blockchain. Okay. So there's a different technology that's moving it around, but what do you mean? They're going to say, okay, everybody goes back to like fight club, zero dollars. And we're just going to give you a spontaneous random amount of dollars. And everyone can just, uh, you know, if you were poor and we decide to give you a trillion, you're rich. But if you had, you know, if you're a billionaire in dollars and now we decide to give you only a few hundred, now you're poor. Oh no, that's not going to work. That's insane. Um, that would lead to mass riots and, and lawlessness and anarchy in the very bad sense where nobody cares about anything and they just start killing each other. So no, that's not going to happen. And, and if they change the technology from the current digital dollar that you see on your screen uh, when you go to your bank account, uh, you know, sign into your app on your bank account, you see a number, that's a digital currency. Put it on a blockchain. The only difference is they can track everything that you do um, and everything that you buy and everything that you sell every second. So do we want that? No, but would it stop the, the collapse? No, it won't. Nothing will stop the collapse. So silver, a metal very far from its nominal all-time highs. No central banks seem to be accumulating it. It isn't looked at as money the same way as gold is by institutions. Um, what are your thoughts on silver here? You know, the amount of comments that I get on any video I post discussing silver, people throwing in the towel and saying that, it's a ridiculous, manipulated market. Silver's going to go sideways for years to come. Um, it's it's quite interesting how low sentiment is at the moment. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how you see the current setup for silver. Well, I'm I'm able to split my brain uh, because I'm a student of history. I know what silver is, and I believe and. I don't. It sounds like an article of religious faith, but it's an article of logic, right? I believe in the regression theorem or the regression principle of Mises, where the, uh, the point is that all prices have to move back into the past or else there's no such thing as prices. Like what I just said before of, well, can they have a reset where they just give people a random amount of dollar of central bank digital dollars or Fed coins or whatever, and then everyone's and expect everyone to behave? No, they can't because prices only make sense if they're extended back into the past, into yesterday, into 10 years ago, into 100 years ago, into 1,000 years ago, into whenever civilization started, right? And money is literally the most liquid commodity and the liquid, the most liquid commodity for the public has always been silver and it still is, right? The only reason it seems illiquid now is because we use gold derivatives. There's no, there's no need for silver if you have a derivative that can divide gold into any amount, into any Satoshi amount, you know, let's talk about the Bitcoin coinage uh, terminology here. It's really popular now. So a Satoshi of, of silver can be accomplished by a penny or, you know, any digital thing that you want. So there's no need for the actual physical material now. So it looks illiquid. Uh, but when the gold derivative is no longer functioning, what are you going to divide gold with to make a retail purchase of groceries at a store? Like, what are you going to use? A, a gold coin? You can't do that because at that point, you know, the entire supermarket might be worth a gold coin. So what are you going to do? Like, here's a gold coin. Give me your entire supermarket or two aisles of food or whatever it's going to be. You're going to need the material, right? Um, if you look at what happened in 1970s, which is where I think we are, I think we're in 1978. You know, you can quote me on that, but I might be wrong. Um, and I think we're in 1978. So from 1974 to 1978, you know, gold, silver made a high of whatever, I think it was like $6.50 or whatever it was, 1974 or early 1975. And then until late 1978, nothing was happening, right? And gold was heading higher, new nominal highs uh, every now and then going up and down, new nominal high, and then a scary jerk down, new nominal high. That was, that's what gold was was doing. Silver was doing nothing. So what do you think the silver bugs were saying back then? Oh, silver is a manipulated market. It's not money, but, but it is because you have to go back into the past. And before we were on a gold standard, we were on a silver standard. Um, they were saying the same thing in the 1970s. And then all of a sudden in, 19, in early 1979, silver started to move very, very 
fast. And what does that mean? It means the public is finally aware that something is going on and that they need to protect themselves. Right. And, and back, and it's always silver because that is the money that all prices are based are based on. We got off the gold, we got off the silver standard in 1873. We moved silver to gold in 1873 um, as a first step towards centralizing the monetary system. It happened all the way back then, 151 years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I understand the sentiment. I understand that silver, the monetary silver markets is a manipulated market. It's been a manipulated market since 1873. Nothing new there. Uh, but it's not going to remain that way. Um, the only question is when. That's always the question. And I think it's not far. It's a month, maybe a year. If we're in 1978, 1979 is the year. So there was an article posted on Zero Hedge recently. U.S. spent more than double what it collected in February as 2024 deficit is second highest ever and debt explodes. You posted the article on X. Twitter or whatever you want to call it these days, and you wrote, plan for the end game, it's absolutely coming. So when the result of all this out of control spending and insane debt comes home to roost, will this be a case of everything happening all at once, leaving most kind of caught with no time to prepare? Yeah, it's going to happen all at once. And I want to, I want to clear up one misconception about the debt, Okay. Um, this is a mistake that a lot of conservative libertarians, right wingers, uh, whatever you want to call us, extreme right wingers, racists, disinformationists, uh, whatever. They, we have a lot of names now. Um, uh, a mistake that a lot of us make, even even the most you know the most orthodox of libertarians, they say, "Well, the government's spending so much money." And if they were just more fiscally responsible, things would be better. Congress is, is, the, is the institution that's going to destroy us all. we got to get out of this debt. It's going to destroy our future. On a very superficial level, that's true. But it's not up to Congress. They're not the ones doing it. Okay, When you're in a fiat system, a fractional reserve system that is based on money being debt, if you take, it's just simple transitive property. Okay, If A equals B, B equals C. If money equals debt... Debt equals money, and if so, if you decrease the debt, you're going to decrease the money supply. If you decrease the money supply, you are going to cause a banking failure. If you cause a banking failure, you're going to cause riots, and people are going to lose their money. And you're going to have to go back to a thirty-five dollar gold standard and then start over. That's going to be a reset. So you, so once you're in a fiat system, you are in an exponential debt system. That that's just the facts. So there's nothing Congress can do. They cannot stop the spending. Even like even if they wanted to, they couldn't. If they do that, the banks will die because they need debt because they because debt is money and they need money to pay their debt and debt needs debt to pay its debt and it just keeps going and going and going until it's done. So it's not Congress's fault. I know how disgusting they are. I'm not saying that they're responsible and they're just doing what they have to do. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're stuck in a system that they cannot control, that the Fed cannot control that nobody can control, and it is going to spiral out of control by its very parabolic nature from the very beginning, from 1934. Very interesting thoughts there. Now, there are voices out there. I've had a few of them on my show, a little few and far between on my program, but that's uh, because I usually have sound money advocates on here. But there are voices saying that things are not nearly as bad as you and many others are making it out to be. They think that the U.S. market, the broad market, is not in a bubble at the moment, but a bull cycle, um, and that these are real companies with profits and they're innovating. And beneath the hyperbolic headlines of economic collapse, the real engine of the American economy is very strong. Some point to the fact that America produces a lot of cheap energy at the moment, particularly in the form of natural gas, and this feeds into industry and the economy, allowing the American economy to remain very strong. I'm wondering how you would respond to to those sentiments. Um, well, how do they measure all this stuff? They they they're caught in a solipsism in uh, in a self referential measurement system where they say, oh, they look at like GDP or something, and like then what's GDP? Well, GDP is the amount of money that transacts in a given amount of time in a given area. So what's that going to depend on? It's going to depend on how many dollars exist. So. They could say exactly everything that they're saying, 
that the economy is great, that uh, that companies are innovating, that blah, blah, blah. They could take all that and and go to Weimar, Germany and say the same thing. Why? Because the look at the GDP in Weimar, you know, it was going crazy. GDP, like money was being transacted instantly like that. Like, wow, look at that. A trillion marks and a pack of gum. And uh, you know, look how look how rich people are. The 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 GDP is like uh, it's going through the roof. Who cares? <laughs> it it doesn't matter. Like if you're going to measure everything by the money supply, if the money supply gets bigger, you're going to say everyone's richer. And if it goes down, you're going to say everyone's poorer. But that has nothing to do with anything. This is all fantasy, right? It it matters how much real wealth exists in a country and and how it's divided. And it can be divided most fairly with a fair monetary system. Right. If if you have a country, let's say, in let's say in the United States, and then uh, how much wealth? I, I don't know how to. Me- I can't even measure wealth. You can measure whatever number you want, and then it belongs to like one guy, and everyone else is starving to death. You have the same GDP numbers. <laughs> so what? You can you can chase these fantasies all you want, but the fact is, everybody's nuts. We're at war. We're uh, you know I've got planes flying over my head uh, every day. Uh, we're on the brink of nuclear catastrophe. Uh, there's hyperinflationary countries all in South America, all around me. And 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 what the hell are they talking about? Like, the world is nuts. I don't know what they're seeing. Well, speaking of South America, you recently interviewed Alan Futterman, a, lib- a libertarian economist from Argentina. I'm wondering what some of the insights you gleaned from that conversation were in regards to the Argentinian economy, the policies of Javier Malay, can he turn things around? Um, hyperinflation in Argentina. You mentioned before we started recording that people had a misconception when it comes to hyperinflation in other countries such as Argentina, Lebanon, etc. So maybe you could also shed some light on that for us. Yeah. So my interview with um, with Alan, and he's been a friend of mine for many years. I finally got him on the show. So I was I was happy about that. Um, that was it was very fascinating because he's he's not real he's not an Austrian economist he's sympathetic to the school uh, and he is he's he has libertarian leanings but he's a, as he said he's a lot more moderate than somebody like me and that's fine like you know, he's he's a good man um, the I had two main disagreements with him but before I get into those I wanted to talk about what I learned from him is that he said his main point that I got. Is that there is an inflection point, and I, I've known this. I just I haven't been able to put it in the terms that he did. There's an inflection point where uh, raising interest rates doesn't doesn't calm down the inflation, by which we mean consumer price increases. It makes it worse. There is an inflection point, and when do you reach that inflection point? When the amount of interest you have to pay on reserves at the central bank is so great that the interest that you pay leaks into the monetary system itself, um, and then it has to circulate. So uh, the reason that a central bank would pay interest on reserves is because it's trying to stop the the money from getting out into the monetary system and control the money supply, right? So they pay higher and higher interest, which is why when you you see in a hyperinflationary economy, you see interest rates start to go crazy, like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, right? They're trying to keep the money from circulating, but the, the interest that they're paying is leaking out anyway. Uh, so in, in Argentina, the situation is insane. Because the amount of the amount of uh, of liabilities, central bank liabilities that are earning interest at the central bank of Argentina, he said, is three times the monetary base, three times the entire monetary base. So this money has to get out somehow, and it keeps keeps it keeps like pooping out. You could say, so you know, for lack of a better word, and uh, and is that what's happening in the United States? Well, we're getting there because we're and that the, this inflection point in the U.S. happened. I believe it was January 1977 when you started seeing interest rates going higher and higher and higher, and at the same time, the inflation, the consumer price inflation rate, moving higher and higher and higher. Anyway, that was 1977 to 1980, 1980, right? And then, the, then the Fed got control of the situation. Didn't know it at the time, but it did. Uh, so we're already there we're, we've moved, the Fed has moved interest rates from, from zero to about 5.4 on the short term and, and consumer price inflation is heading higher anyway. So what are they going to do? They're going to raise interest rates and it's going to make them lose even more money because he was, he was talking about how the central bank of Argentina works. It's crazy. So the, the let's say the, the government of Argentina needs 
Um, it needs money to uh, for public spending on whatever. So they give the central bank an IOU, like, a, and then it, the central bank buys it, can't sell it because it has no market value, and then they hand over pesos to the government. So the central bank is filled with IOUs that are worth nothing and the, the money circulates, <laughs> the money circulates anyway. And that those are losses on the central bank balance sheet. And the Fed has those losses too. It's just not as much yet. It's like 160 billion now. But the higher they raise interest rates, the more those losses are going to be. And, and, and how do they, what do they call those losses? Oh, they, they call them deferred assets. Like, what do you mean I'm broke? I have a whole bunch of deferred assets. Well, yeah, bums have deferred assets too. They're called being a bum and not paying your bills. A bill that you didn't pay is a deferred asset. <laughs> So, so it's a bum. Um, the, I had two disagreements with him. The first one uh, was that he said that he doesn't think that the, the, the hyperinflationary situation in, in, let's say, in Argentina or Lebanon or, or Egypt, what's going on in Egypt now. Um, if you haven't known, Egypt is in hyperinflation too now. Um, I think it started on March 3rd or 4th, something like that. He said that um, that because this hyperinflation has been drawn out so long in places like Argentina, then it's gonna then it, then all the more so Kava Homer, it's gonna take even more time for the dollar itself to hyperinflate. But then I looked into the reasoning and it didn't it didn't make sense because the way I see it, what is the mechanism that is drawing out the hyperinflations in Argentina? Why is it lasting so long? Why does it last ten years where you have 20, 30, 40 percent inflation every year and it's just it's just never ending and it just kills people instead of just being like a rip the bandaid off the money's dead and that's it right why not because when the when prices start to rise in in um when prices start to rise in pesos terms what do people do they buy what they need and then they take whatever savings they have left and they buy us dollars so it's a flight to us dollars and where do they get those dollars on the black market from the us at, at you know in some line of drug dealers and laundering and whatever so they they chase after us dollars and that itself means that that the inflation that would have been in the in the states is now in Argentina sharing the burden of that dollar inflation. And so, yeah, the dollar is better for them than the peso. Uh, but that's the mechanism that prolongs the hyperinflation because they still have a functioning currency they can sort of use, right? And then it just it just prolongs the inevitable. So then, what happens when the dollar itself hyperinflates? Because in the the home current the home country in the domestic market in the in the U.S. food prices are going crazy. Well, all the, what happens is the exact opposite, right? The Americans don't have any other currency to latch onto. It doesn't exist because the dollar is the base of it all. So then what happens is that all the inflation that was exported didn't disappear. It still exists in the central bank balance sheets of all these other con car, uh, countries and you know, all the black markets of all these, uh, the, these drug dealers or whatever that sell U.S. dollars in the black market. They all get rid of them and then they send them back to America. And then once, th once that happens, you have like, like very fast hyperinflation in the dollar. And then it's the hyperinflation of the whole world. So that's, a, that, that's why the hyperinflation of the dollar is going to be that much quicker. And it's not going to be drawn out like it is in third world countries because there's no other currency to rely on. The, the other disagreement that I had with him, it just, it just remembered, was he believes that if Mille, you, t you asked about Javier Mille, his point, and I believed it at the time, but I don't think he's right about this either. And I'm not sure about this. It's not like this is my position, but I, I think this is right. Um, that he said that if Javier Mille just like rips the bandaid off, destroys the entire monetary system, um, allows hyperinflation to just like whoop through the roof, then he risks, essentially he's saying he risks, um, anarchy and a loss of law and order completely. And then he might get, you know, thrown out of the country or killed or lynched or something. And, and then a communist dictator could, you know, come into his place. And I, and I said, okay, well, that's plausible. Before I stake a position on that, let me think about it. And now I think he's wrong. Um, because, you know, we, we just said they're, they're hoarding U.S. dollars, right? There's still gold and silver there. Um, so if there's no more peso, then people use the dollar as the circulating currency. And then it's not that they get off the pyramid, but they do step down it, you know, one or two steps. And it becomes a little bit safer. And from there, they can start accumulating gold if they're smart or silver or both, right? Argentina, land of silver, do it. So 
Um, I think the only, I think Rothbard was right. You got to, if, if, if you're a libertarian, you use this analogy, like if there was a button, if you're a real libertarian, if there's a button that you could just like push forever and it just makes the government smaller and smaller and smaller, you'd blister your thumb, you'd bleed your fingers pushing that button, not, not even worrying about the consequences. Uh, because if you don't, because this system is going to implode, explode, go supernova anyway, you may as well do it now. Um, because the 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 farther it goes, the worse the explosion is going to be, and you've got to have you've got to have logic and you've got to have faith. You've got to like twist your not twist in a bad sense, but weave or braid your faith around your logic in a in a strong rope, and then and then trust that it will pull you out of a crisis. So I want to discuss potential systemic issues in the banking system in the United States. We've now seen New York Community Bank Corp's share price collapse. This is from an article in New York Times. New York Community Bank, the lender teetering under mounting real estate-related losses, shared several pieces of fresh bad news. Its fourth quarter losses were $2.4 billion, worse than it had earlier stated. Its chief executive and an allied board member are out, and the bank has identified what it called material weaknesses in internal controls. I think that's just... You know, I think that means the CEO is ripping off the company. Right, right. So is this, you know, along with last year's bank failures, we saw, is this another canary in the coal mine exposing systemic risk in the banking sector? Systemic risk, um, systemic risk. The entire banking system is centralized. When you have a centralized system, it's, it is systemic. It's all tied together. So that's what central banking is. That's why there's a central bank to centralize the banking system. So if one bank fails, it affects another bank because everything's part of the system. The only question is what, what part of the centralized system has to fall in order for everything else to fall with it. So New York, New York Community Bank Corp is just another bank that had a, you know, a, a commercial mortgage backed security deal on some office building somewhere that uh, went to hell because, uh, you know, they locked everybody in their houses four years ago and said, don't come to the office anymore. So people got used to that and said, Oh, you don't know your office anymore. Screw the office. And, uh, the, the, the price of the offices went down. Wow. Who could have seen that? Like you lock people out of their offices and offices don't have value anymore. Well, this is amazing. <laughs> so, and then the banks that own the offices, they get screwed. And then they knock over another bank, which holds another office, and they get screwed. So, uh, you know, if you invested in San Francisco, they're like you're dead. Uh, they, well, I remember the the first the first bits of news about New York Community Bank Corp when they when they came out with it, uh, their first drop. It, it wasn't the internal controlling stuff, but you know, you can imagine that there's going to be a lot of hanky panky in these companies when they realize that they're screwed, but they don't want to tell the public yet, so they're going to start hiding things, and that's the internal control stuff. So it, it, you know, it, it all feeds into itself, right? The, the losses are going to lead to fraud, which are going to lead to public statements, which are going to lead to the price, the, the stock price just tanking. Um, they, so anyway, at the beginning of this uh, New York Community Bank Corp collapse, and New York Community Bank Corp, I think, was one of the rescuing banks last year in March 2023. Now they, they're dead, um, or they're a, they're like you know an, an animated corpse now. Uh, so. They were saying that that oh it's just one commercial building or one commercial loan and that's it and everything else is fine, but you know that's all you need just one loan to go bad and then everything goes down the drain. So some other bank has one or two loans that are going bad right now, and no, it's not contained. Nothing is contained in a centralized system. You can only be contained if you're not connected to other things, right? In a banking system, everything is centralized. One bank goes down, another bank will go down unless every bank is bailed out at the same time. So it'll be one or the other. And either way, uh, the end game's coming. Well, how are you personally preparing for the end game scenario? And how can your average person get ready? Is it a matter of stacking gold and silver, making sure you have a reliable food supply as well as water, keeping a good community around you, um, things like that? Are there other things people can also do to prepare? Community is the most important thing. You have to be around people who are not insane uh, because uh, insane people will come after you and your resources if they are desperate. Um, if they are the type of people that mutilate their children, if they're the type of people that um, they're woke or whatever they are, 
uh, they have no skills, they're on welfare, they will come after you. So get away from them. Get away from the cities, get away from the big cities, be in a small community of people with a, a, a strong system of morals. And that way, even if they're poor, they won't come knocking on your door with a machete. They'll come, you know, knocking on your door saying, please let me, you know, let me help you. I'll, I'll help plant your garden and, you know, give me a silver coin, whatever. And they can help you like be around good moral people have uh, what, what I'm doing to prepare is uh, I'm uh, well, I'm going to be speaking in Petah Tikva uh, on Monday on money, trying to get the Israeli community to finally understand what the hell's going on here. And they're, they don't really get it. So uh, hopefully I'll break into that and uh, start a help start a community of um, of sane people who understand money. So community is the most important thing. Um, uh, I do a show with uh, with a guy named Phil Lowe on my channel, and he was just telling me a, a few weeks ago about how, how how he got a lot of his neighbors to to um, sink not sink to invest exchange whatever uh, about a million dollars into gold and silver in a week just by starting um, a WhatsApp group or a signal group or whatever it was because people, people, the, a lot of people who have a basic sense of morality and what reality is understand intuitively that gold and silver are money, understand intuitively that Bitcoin is not. Um, and I'm, I'm not against speculating in Bitcoin. I'm against, I'm, I'm against treating it as money. Okay. Speculating is fine if you want to do that. Um, they, ha they have a sense for that and you can get your neighbors to understand this. And the more people that have silver, the better, because the problem isn't, the the problem isn't that there isn't enough silver. The supply of silver is the supply of silver, right? It is what it is. Or the supply of gold is the supply of gold. The problem is that the the supplies of it are too centralized and piled up and they're not diffused enough. We have to have as many people have gold and silver as possible. And that provides a huge base for an economy, right? If the economy rests on gold and silver, it's not going to be able to rest on huge piles you know, it's not going to be stable. So you need a lot of people to have it. The more people that have it, the more stable your community will be. Um, if I were in America, I'd, I'd become Amish, <laughs> or I'd pretend to be Amish and, uh, I'd, I just move in with them. Um, but I've, I've gone to Israel because that's where my family is. That's where my people are. I mean, my larger family, my family's still in America, but I trust my people not to kill each other when this happens. And it's going to happen here too. And I want to be among my people and everyone should be among their people, whatever your people are considered and um, strengthen them. Yeah, very well said. That that hits home for me. Get away from insane people, which is why I left Canada and be around people with a strong moral compass, which is why I'm in the Balkans, where the vast majority adhere to helping others and also nobody trusts the government. So um, I, I think I'm in a, in a good spot at the moment now. We are going through what seems to be unprecedented times. As you mentioned, everybody's gone insane. I mean, it's it's just bizarre. I'll, I'll, you know, we don't delve into topics like gender reassignment surgery and stuff like that on this show, but it's called it's called affirmation, Jesse. It's called affirmation. Yes, that's that's right. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, you see kids getting taken away from their parents. Yeah, and um because the parents refuse to affirm the child's chosen gender identity. Like the fact that this is happening and that the whole society isn't up at arms about it, but it's actually going along with it is a sign of a very sick society, most definitely. Now, I wonder how much of all of this is amplified by new technology we have like social media where we have 24 seven access to news cycle where multiple participants have an agenda. Um, I'm wondering how much you think that amplifies things maybe greater than they need to be. And I'm wondering how you personally, you know, block out the noise and separate fact from fiction. It's very difficult. It's, it's impossible to block out the noise and it, it's, it's impossible to really know what is fact or fiction anymore. And so I can't. Um, so I'll answer this in two ways. So first of all, um, you know, there's a, there's a rabbinic tradition talking about the end of days that the, the world will be just flooded with lies and, no, and it, it won't, nothing will make any sense. 
which is pretty much what's happening now. I can't tell what is going on. I don't know what happened on, on Shemini Atzeret, on uh, what people say, call October 7th. I don't know exactly what happened. I just know it was really bad. That's the extent of what I know, right? Um, I don't know who did it. I don't know if it was an inside job. I don't know if it wasn't. I don't know if it was, I, I don't know anything. Um, <clears throat> so, so what do I do? Um, I focus on my family. I focus on the things that I do know. I know I, I know I love my kids. I know I love my wife. I know um, my neighbors are pretty decent, at least now, now that the whole um, medical insanity is over with for now. Um, I know what my past generations have told me, what I have to do. I know they have said that I'm go that we're going to enter in an insane time and to calm down. Uh, and there's also one other thing I know. I know that this is a symptom of the, the constant news cycle and the, everybody saying everything all the time, all at once. It's, it's, it's also a symptom of inflation. Um, uh, because in, inf what, what inflation does is it, it pours demand into areas that they shouldn't be in because it pours dollars into like, let's say in, in into overdevelopment, you know, in the, in the 19th century, it was railroads, uh, in, um, in let's skipping all the way to 2008, it was housing, uh, in, in, in the 1980s, it was savings and loans banks, but there's always one sector. So in, in this insanity, it seems to be information. Right, social media. The, why do people go on Twitter all the time? Why? Why do? But like, even shows like yours and mine, we're part of it. But we're but we're trying to say the truth and saying this. Everything that I'm saying, everything that you're saying, there's no, there shouldn't be any need for this. People talk about what money is. You just trade. <laughs> but the 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 problem is like we know that we're in a lie and we're going into the system of lies and saying, hey, this whole thing is a lie. And the, what, what, you're part of the system too, telling me that it's a liar. Are you a liar too? No, we're, this is how we communicate now. Okay. There's no choice. So when this is done and, and money goes back to being honest, there's going to be a lot more investment in things like growing food or growing healthy food or figuring out how to farm without destroying the planet and all these, these other necessary things. And, you know, people are going to be communicating or pretending to communicate on Twitter much less because the, the, the amount of investment that it's going to take to run these servers, to store all these tweets and all this social media and the amount of ad revenue you're going to earn on YouTube is going to plummet and people are going to have to go back to work and stop being idiots. Okay. So, uh, th that's, what's going to happen. Well, Rafi, it's been an enlightening conversation as always. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. For those who do want to learn more about the Endgame Investor, uh, tell us about it and where people can find it. Yeah, please subscribe to my Substack at endgameinvestor.substack.com. I usually put out a once weekly free article uh, on you know monetary philosophy, or I, I put usually in my posts I put like a you know a philosophical sort of few paragraphs um, to help organize people's minds as to what's happening instead in, in, rather than like saying, I think gold will be at X amount in a week or whatever. Uh, so you can get that stuff for free. And if you want more of my uh, like in-depth market analysis, you can become a paid subscriber. Um, and I run a Patreon where I only, it's a really nominal price of $3 a month uh, or $30 a year uh, where I give a more religious angle on what's happening and what this, uh, for people who are into the God angle, um, I try to plug in the past with the present. Uh, and you know, my YouTube channel, you can follow me at Rafi Farber, where I try to make fun videos. We're making fun of the insanity, uh, and, uh, making it as light as I can, because I, I pretty much do it for my own head. Otherwise I'd go insane. Uh, those are the ways you can, you can, uh, you can help me. Uh, support me and um, help get me through the end game and I'll help you get there too. Great. Well, I'll put links to all of that in the description below for people to check out. Thank you once again, Rafi. As always, it's been a blast. Thanks, Jesse. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by Arc Silver Gold Osmium. Visit them at arcsgo.com and contact the owner, Ian Everard, today at 307-264- 9441 or by email at ian at arcsgo.com and make sure to tell them the commodity culture sent you and I'll see you guys on the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. 
If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.